Hi everyone, um, my name is Tin Nguyen and uh, I'm a sales engineer here at Cisco Cloud Security. Uh, a little background about myself, I um, joined uh, Cisco Umbrella um, OpenDNS as a, uh, as a support engineer and then moved on to their uh, learning and enablement team before I um, became a sales engineer. Um, and on the call with me now, we have uh, my colleague, Sean Fury. Um, he's going to be uh, fielding your questions as I go through um, the overview of Umbrella as well as uh, um, uh, the, the demo after that. So let me just start my presentation. Um, so a quick agenda, uh, like I said, we're going to be going over very quickly um, challenges that we're facing um, today with uh, security. Um, and then a quick overview of Umbrella itself, uh, followed by a demo of the dashboard, and then some time for any Q&A at the very end. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and throw them into the Q&A um, chat window in the WebEx uh, event, and we can answer them there as well. Okay, so challenges. Um, taking a look at the challenges, you can see, you know, before everything was contained in this little nice little circle, right? All of your critical infrastructure, your business apps, all your desktops and users were within this ring, all right? But that has fundamentally changed. Um, and what has changed? More, more users are going off network, right? Um, you're also uh, you're also seeing a lot of these uh, critical infrastructure and business apps moving to the cloud, right? Um, users are no longer uh, users no longer need to actually connect to the corporate network to get work done. They use cloud apps like you know Salesforce and Office 365 and Google to get things done now. And additionally, they don't turn on their VPN, which means they're more vulnerable and uh, uh, more vulnerable to attacks, and you know leaves you with a lack of visibility and protection, right? Uh, we're also seeing the branch offices are connecting directly to the internet, right? Um, it's expensive to backhaul traffic to the corporate network. So um, as we see these branch offices move into um, you know, direct internet access, you're going to see that. Um, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, you're going to you're going to see a lot more threats that they're going to be exposed to. Um, Taking a look at the numbers here, I'm just going to go through them really quickly. Um, you know, 49% of the mobile workforce or of the workforce is mobile. 82% um, of them admit to not using the VPN at all. Uh, we're seeing a, a you know a increase in not only SaaS usage but um, you know uh, branch offices going to the uh, directly to the internet. And why does this matter? Well, because these changes create new challenges, right? Um, and with these challenges, um, security must shift as well. So we're taking a look now at so, uh, some of the challenges that uh, we and pain points that our customers have told to us, right? Um, gaps in visibility and coverage. Um, organizations now have more locations than devices to protect. Um, these threats are using different ports and, to try and gain access and exfiltrate data, right? And companies need to. Uh, the, the complete visibility into all of this internet activity. We're also seeing that employees use more cloud applications, um, some of them sanctioned, some of them unsanctioned, right? And organizations need to know which one of these are being used, and they need to protect the data in those apps. We're also seeing that um, the, the security tools that um, you know, teams are using are too complex and, and siloed, right? Um, they don't integrate very well or share information or intelligence in a very um, friendly or programmatic way, right? And these teams, they need solutions that are easy to deploy, simple to manage, and can scale exponentially. Last but not least, and this is the big one right here, right? Malware and ransomware. Um, this is the number one challenge we hear from customers like you. Um, despite the existing security stack that they have deployed, you know, everything from firewalls to web proxies, email security, um, and endpoint protection, these companies still face um, a lot of malware infections and phishing attacks. And security teams are spending a lot of time trying to detect and remediate these things after the fact, right? So um, organizations need to stop these threats before they get into the network or endpoints. And this is where, this is where um, Umbrella steps in. So Umbrella is Cisco's cloud-based DNS, uh, DNS security solution, and it works and behaves uh, very differently than your usual security tools. Uh, Umbrella provides the first line of defense against threats on the internet wherever users go. So by analyzing and learning from internet activity patterns, Umbrella automatically uncovers attacker infrastructure staged for current and emerging threats. 
And we proactively block malicious requests before they even reach your uh, network or endpoints. With Umbrella, um, customers can stop phishing and malware infections earlier, identify already infected devices faster, and prevent data exfiltration. And because Umbrella is built into the foundation of the internet and delivered from the cloud, it provides complete visibility in internet activity across all locations and all your users. And on top of that, it's the simplest security product, um, uh, product to deploy and to manage as well. So where does Umbrella fit, right? Uh, Umbrella sits at the very edge of your network here, and it operates at the DNS layer preceding your firewall. You're protecting users from uh, accessing malicious content no matter where they are, and more importantly, before it reaches your network. So what do you use to protect your network and your endpoints today, right? Uh, you probably have a range of products deployed at your corporate headquarters or branch offices, or even on your roaming laptops. Each of these have a different approach to protecting your end users from threats daily, and each play a different role to provide you protection for you and your users. So it's important to understand that there are many ways that malware can get in which is why it's important to have multiple layers of security no matter where your users are connecting from. But with Umbrella, it all starts with DNS. Um, it's a foundational component of the internet, right? It's used by every network device and happens at the beginning of every internet transaction. This is why Umbrella is your first line of defense. It's an intelligent recursive DNS resolver that helps enforce what de destinations the user should or shouldn't be accessing on the internet. And not only does it provide DNS security, but it prevents malicious IP connections and prevent malicious file downloads as added features as well. And this is up regardless of port or protocol. So how does it work? Um, so when Umbrella receives a DNS request, right, it first identifies which user the request is coming from and which policy to apply, right? Next, Umbrella determines if the request is A, safe listed or uh, white listed, I mean, um, B, malicious or blacklisted, or C, um, risky, um, risky or domains that are unknown or need further inspection. So if we get a safe request that gets routed norm as per normal, right? They get the um, IP information, they go on their way. If it's a malicious request, known malicious request, we route the connection back to a block page with a brief explanation of why that domain is blocked. And for risky requests, we route the connection to our cloud-based selective proxy for deeper inspection. And our selective proxy is different from your traditional web proxies, right? Um, your, their, your traditional ones, will, which analyzes all of your in internet requests. Um, this adds latency. It also adds complexity for your end users, right? So not the, the greatest user experience. With Umbrella, um, we're only forwarding requests to our selective proxy for domains that may host malicious content. This means that your users aren't subject to the, the typical performance issues that is, uh, is associated with proxies that is offered by other vendors. So what do I mean by risky domains? Um, so most phishing and malware, ransomware, and other threats are hosted at domains that exhibit malicious behavior, right? And they're blocked at the domain level right away. But some domains host both malicious and safe content at the same time. So this is what we consider risky. Um, these often allow users to upload and share content, and, and that, ma that makes them very difficult to police. So we need, a more, um, we need to more accurately determine if these are safe or malicious. So once we have identified a risky domain, what do we inspect? Uh, we start with the URL inspection. We use Cisco Talos Intelligence, um, the Cisco Web Reputation System, and other third-party feeds to determine if this URL is malicious. So, um, on top of that, a customer can also create a list of custom URLs to be blocked based on their policies, right? Now, if the disposition is still unknown after this uh, URL is inspected, um, the web address, um, uh, the, sorry, the, and the web address for that, uh, that web hosted file matches one of our, you know, our file tabs, for example, you know, a PDF or a JPEG, et cetera. Um, we then look at the file reputation. We use AV engines and Cisco's um, AMP uh, to block malicious files before they're downloaded. All right, so our view of the internet differentiates us from um, many other security providers, right? Um, Umbrella comes from Cisco's acquisition of OpenDNS from a few years ago. Um, OpenDNS uh, has been providing DNS services since 2006. 
and has had, has had, had a 100% uptime since then. And we've grown tremendously since then. And right now we're receiving over like 175 billion DNS requests per day. And just to give you a little bit of perspective on that, that's just slightly below Google's DNS resolvers and they don't even provide any security protection. Um, so how do we differentiate ourselves from vendors providing DNS security and protection? Um, we're not only resolving in enterprise traffic, right? O OpenDNS was founded as a recursive DNS service and it was free to use by anyone and they are still um, free today. And a key part of our user base is for home users. So you know, like I said, we're not just resolving enterprise traffic. In a work setting, users know where and where they shouldn't go, right? Whereas home users will be more likely to go, um, to go wherever they want and are more susceptible to clicking on malicious links. So uh, our analysis of both enterprise and home users, plus the added intelligence from Cisco Talos and for endpoints and our partnerships and integrations, um, provide us a proprietary data set that we can mine and protect against current threats, but also you know, helps us predict and prevent potential attacks as well. Um, the Umbrella Global Network includes about like 30 data centers around the world. Um, we resolve requests from more than 90 million users across, uh, across 160 countries every day. Um, we're also peering with 800 of the top ISPs and CDNs to exchange B BGP routes and ensure that we're routing requests efficiently and not adding any latency over regional um, DNS providers. So not only do we have a massive amount of data, um, more importantly, we also have a very diverse data set. So how are we building this kind of this threat intelligence, right? Um, I want to take I want us to take a look at really quickly the um, these three three um, buckets right here: data, models, and security researchers. So let's start with like data, right? In addition to Umbrella's massive and diverse data, we have Cisco Talos's feed of malicious domains and IPs. And based on researcher analysis of, of millions of malware samples, um, terabytes of data collected from Cisco deployments worldwide, right? Um, the second factor here is the security researchers, right? Um, this is the human element. They look at this data and use um, techniques like data mining and 3D visualization to identify patterns. And they're constantly finding ways, um, new ways to uncover fingerprints that attackers leave behind. And, you know, they build statistical models and machine learning models to automatically score and classify all this data. Um, and those models that I just mentioned, right? Um, they're continuously run against um, this data that we, we get on a, on a uh, daily basis. And uh, that's, you know, including malicious domains, IPs, URLs. Um, and we're not just taking in historical reputational scores, right? We're, we're looking at and ingesting uh, historical and live data and what's currently happening on the internet to help identify and categorize these malicious domains with a high uh, level of efficacy. All right, let's now take a look at some of your deployment options, okay? Uh, regardless if your user is on or off network, at home, at the airport, you know, at a random coffee shop, on their guest not Wi-Fi, right? Um, you know, they might not even be connected to the corporate VPN. Uh, um, so with on-network coverage, right, you can protect all devices on your network, even those you don't own, um, by simply registering your egress or public IP address and pointing your DNS forwarders to the umbrella resolvers. Right. Um, on top of that, customers have several advanced deployment options depending on the level of granula granularity you'll need in terms of reporting, attribution, or policy enforcement. Um, and for example, that's like integrating with Active Directory, right? Uh, for off-network coverage, uh, we offer a lightweight agent called the roaming client that's installed on your endpoints that forwards all requests to the umbrella resolvers regardless of what network you're on. And as, uh, on top of that, if you're using Cisco AnyConnect for VPN connectivity, you can use our built-in module to enable roaming security within, uh, within that. Um, so because Umbrella is delivered from the cloud, there's no hardware to install or software to manually update, and the browser-based interface um, provides quick setup and ongoing management, we see that many of our enterprise customers can deploy in less than 30 minutes. So uh, the thing here it, you know, to remember, it's you know, very easy to manage, quick to deploy, and um, and yeah, you'll see right now when we, uh, when we uh, bring up the dashboard here for the demo, um, how easy it is to, to, to get this going. 
All right. So now that you've completed the high level overview of the, um, the umbre of, uh, umbrella, how do you get uh, a trial started? Um, you can either reach out to you know, any of your, your Cisco partners or account managers, or you can simply go to signup.umbrella.com. Uh, once you've got a uh, trial spun up, um, it's just a matter of registering your public IP address and then pointing your forwarders to us, and you're done. So with that, I'm going to skip over and start the demo part of this. Okay, so um, after you log in, this is the uh, first page that you encounter, and this is our overview. Um, this is the 10,000 foot, uh, foot view of um, all network activity that's happening, um, that's happening right now. Um, you can take a look, and it, it will show you the overall deployment health of all your, um, of your components, right? We have your networks that you've registered, um, how many uh, active roaming clients you have, um, et cetera. Next, we have a breakdown of uh, what's actually happening on your network, right? Um, the total blocks, the blocks that you're getting. Um, how many of those total blocks are security blocks versus category blocks? Um, within that, you can see, you know, um, you know, of those security blocks, how many of those are phishing, how many of those are command and control, how many of those are crypto mining, et cetera. Um, this little widget down here tells you about app discovery and, con and control. We'll, we'll go, go more into this as we get into the policies and reporting session. Um, but you can see that we have, um, we're taking a look at shadow IT as well too. Um, how many of, uh, w what kind of apps are being used uh, on your network, right? On, um, on supervised devices and unsupervised devices, right? Maybe on your, B uh, bring, it, bring your own devices, for example. Lastly here, we have um, the most blocked requests that can be filtered by top destination, uh, top identities, and also by type as well. And taking a look at um, your deployment options here, um, we're going to first start off with um, the network identity, right? So if you take a look at the identities here, um, identities are basically um, an entity that, basic, uh, that can uh, be reported uh, on or enforced against, right? So it can be as high level as a network or as granular as a Active Directory user, for example, right? Uh, but the first thing we always do with the uh, uh, with deployment is uh, registering a network. And you can do that by hitting the network here, going in and adding your HQ here. And if you don't know the, if you don't have the IP, uh, the egress IP of your, um, of your network, uh, corporate network handy, um, you can use something like, you know, what's my IP.com or uh, ipchicken.com to get that. And um, we also have that right here. If you, You don't want to visit another site for that. Um, so once you've uh, once you've put in your IP address here, um, you can register a single IP, which is a slash 32, or we also take um, um, CIDR ranges all the way down to slash uh, 16s, right? Um, if you are registering a network um, bigger than a slash uh, 28, I believe, um, it gets verified uh, with our support team to make sure that there's no conflicts um, within our system on the IP addresses and to make sure that you actually own that range. Um, so after you register your network, um, your, the next step here is to point your DNS to our servers at these two uh, IP addresses here. And for off-network protection, we have our roaming computers. I'm going to show you that right now. Um, roaming computers, once registered to the dashboard, will show up here, and you can see their overall health, and um, you can see their, their status, um, uh, their individual status by clicking on each, each one here. The roaming client uh, can actually be downloaded here at the, um, uh, at, on the roaming, uh, roaming computers page. We have two um, standard packages uh, for the standalone client, one for Windows and one for Mac. Um, they are just a basic MSI or PKG file uh, with a step-by-step -step wizard that walks you through the actual installation. Um, if you're leveraging the AnyConnect um, uh, VPN, we also have a module here that you can download um, that activates the, um, the uh, security within, the, um, within AnyConnect. Um, 
the actual, um, sorry about that. Let me just go back to go on with computers here. Okay. Um, the the other network, or sorry, the other identities that we um, support here um, that you might be interested if you're uh, if um, you're currently using those on your network. We have support for Chromebook as well as um, iOS devices. So if you do have an MDM solution in place and um, you have supervised devices, we do have a, a individual clients for both uh, for for um, iOS and um, Chromebook here. Next up, uh, we have policies. So I'm going to go into our policy list here. Um, you can see at the very bottom here, we have this default policy. Now, the default policy is um, your, your catch-all, right? The, this default policy is applied to all the identities that are registered to your dashboard. Um, that's including Roman clients, networks, um, you know, your, Chromebook, uh, your Chromebook clients, etc. Um, and this, this default policy is the, the, the catch-all policy, and it cannot be deleted, right? Um, as we build policies, um, let me just go and do that step right through this. As we build um, policies, um, as you can see here that they, um, you know, this is, this is taking a very top-down uh, approach to, um, to enforcement, right? Uh, very much like a firewall. So whatever policy, um, whatever policy and identity hits first um, gets applied. So let's go through the steps of actually creating a policy here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and target uh, the roaming computers. Um, I want to target all the roaming computers in this in this uh, example here, but you can you can easily go in and individually select users if you wanted to as well. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go go back and I want to target all of my roaming computers. And what should this policy do? Of course, we want to enforce security at the DNS layer, right? Protecting them against um, the big, the big, um, uh, the big ones like malware, phishing, and command and control. Um, we want to be able to inspect files, right? And also um, limit the uh, limit their content, um, their access to certain content. Um, we also want to be able to control applications that are, they're using, uh, you know, on their devices as well, too. As well as uh, applying, you know, uh, destination lists, black uh, blacklists, and whitelists, etc. Now, for se security settings, um, as a default, we have malware, command and control uh, callbacks, and phishing turned on. Right? Um, you can also turn on some of these other um, security categories as well, too. Right? Um, I, I I like to tell, uh, depending on the risk tolerance of, uh, you know. Um, your particular organization. Um, I like to tell folks to you know, turn on crypto mining, um, new domains, and potentially harmful domains as well. Um, as far as dynamic DNS and DNS tunneling, if, you, if you're expecting this traffic to, to come um, you know, onto your network, you can, you can choose to turn that on or not. But um, you know, be sure that we're going to block those if they're, if they're switched on and categorized as so. Um, I'm going to turn all those on and go to next. So the next part of uh, the policy creation is um, limiting content access, right? Um, so this is content filtering here. Uh, we have three uh, predefined groups that you can choose from. Starting with low, this is going to be all your tasteless categories, right? Pornography, um, you know, sexuality, et cetera. Um, moving into moderate, you're going into tasteless and illegal activity, which includes gambling, um, you know, um, terrorism, weapons, et cetera. Um, our last predefined category here is including all of the tasteless and illegal activities, but also throwing in um, social, uh, social networking sites, um, time wasters like uh, gaming sites, et cetera. We have the ability to actually customize this list as well, too, right? So if you go into our custom list, um, we have hun almost, I think, 100 category, uh, categories now um, that you can choose from individually. Now, let's say you, you, want to, you, you like one of these predefined settings, but you want to add a little bit more customization to that. You can do that as well, too, right? You can throw in one of our um, predefined or pre-can uh, groups here and just add to those categories if you'd like. I'm just going to go ahead and click low and proceed. Um, so um, controlling applications. Now, um, 
we, we categorize um, a lot of the apps that are, 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 are found on your network here. And what we can do is basically um, block a uh, – block a a, an app category outright, or if you wanted, for, for example, to target Facebook.com, right? Um, instead of you having to create a, you know, a block list for all the Facebook.com, um, uh, for all the Facebook.com addresses that um, they'll use, um, for example, if you are using Messenger, for uh, Messenger, um, and if you are, you know, I think they have, you know, CDN uh, specific Facebook CDNs that they they host their videos and images on, right? Instead of you having to create that list, um, you can block all of those outright by using this uh, this application control uh, feature here. I'm not going to turn that on right now, but oops. let's go. Let's cancel that. And, oops. Sorry about that. Let me click through this really quickly again. So um, we, I just broke, uh, spoke briefly about our, our destination list here. That uh, we have a global and uh, a global allow and block list that is applied to all of your policies and all of your identities. Um, but you can create custom ones as well too. Um, if you, for example, would like to, um, you know, enable the uh, marketing marketing department to access Facebook for their social media needs, for example, you can create a specific policy um, and uh, allow them to allow or allow them to visit those uh, social media sites using this destination list here. Um, we also see people use uh, as a as a different uh, or as another use case. You can see that we have um, users blocking regions, right? So if you're doing all your business in the United States, for example, and you want to block all incoming connections from China and Russia um, um, at the site level or at the domain level, um, you can put in their region code right here and um, block all of them at once. I'm going to go ahead and click next here. Um, the last thing we have to set up uh, is the block page, right? So when a user gets um, redirected to one of our block pages, this is what it's going to look like right here. All right, so it's um, branded with Cisco Umbrella with a little message and some information on why it was being blocked. Now, you can customize this yourself if you go into use a custom appearance. You can see that you can um, go in and throw in your own logo, for example, in there um, if you want to brand that block page yourself. You can provide your own messaging um, to the user why that, that uh, particular site was being blocked. Um, you can also even um, uh, allow users to contact an admin for, you know, for example, the IT team or the network team um, to, to, to flag a site that was maybe you know, um, categorized uh, incorrectly, for example. So um, those, are, those are your block page uh, um, options right there. Um, the two other ones that I want to bring up are bypass users and bypass codes, right? So if, if a user hits a, a certain bypass page, or sorry, if a certain user hits a block page and you, you want to allow this user to, um, to bypass that, that particular page, you can create a AD specific um, bypass user here in this section, or you can create a code. Um, now this code, um, is very useful if you, if you have, for example, a temporary worker, like a contractor that, that's coming on site, right? You can create this code and have them be able to bypass, um, bypass um, certain block pages if it's necessary for their job, right? And um, you can also set the, um, the expiration date on this too. So if you know they're finishing their work on March 15th, you can say, you know, cut the, cut the code on this at 5 p.m. when the day ends. Um, so that is um, how we. Sorry, I'm gonna go back to default appearance. We're gonna hit next here. So once you've um, once you've uh, completed everything, the summary the, the summary will be presented to you, and you'll just give your uh, this policy a descriptive name, and you're basically set. So that was a, that was setting up a policy. And one thing that I do want to point out while we're here is this policy tester that we have. Um, clicking on the policy tester here on the um, policy list page, um, this handy tool basically shows what, a, uh, what policy a user um, is, is hitting um, in your list. So for example, if we want to take a look at this Billy user here, 
and we want to see what kind of access he has to Facebook.com. We go ahead and run that. And it will, it will actually show us what is being triggered for that identity, right? What policy is being triggered for that identity? Um, this actual destination was allowed, and you can see it was allowed because of the following policy. Oops, let me just close this right here. You can see this policy was allowed for, uh, for Billy here um, at, for this at-home policy. Now, the, the great thing about this, uh, about this policy tester tool is that it also shows um, the other policies that Billy would have hit if this top policy wasn't in place. So I find that really ha handy if you have a bunch of policies and identities that you're, you're managing. Next, uh, we're going to go transition into um, reporting here. And, um, you know, re reports, sorry, let me close the policy section and go into reporting really quickly. There you go. Um, the reports here, you know, this is really important to kind of help you gather information and to inform your, you know, security de decisions, right? Um, if you need to, um, you know, create a certain policy because you're seeing uh, more blocks to a certain category, or you're seeing crypto mining, um, you know, uh, crypto mining activity happening on your network, and you don't have a policy in place for that right now, right? Uh, reports give you a, a chance to kind of dig up that information. And what I want to do is I want to focus on three core reports that I like to share every time I, uh, I uh, go through a demo. Um, the first one here is the activity search. I'm going to close the window so you can see this a little bit better. Um, the, the activity search here, um, this basically shows all of the allowed and um, blocked domains that you have um, coming onto your network, right? Um, they are going to be categorized, um, sorry, they're going to be listed by identity. Um, you can also see the destination that they're, they're, trying, to, um, they're trying to access, um, whether it was blocked or allowed, um, and then what category uh, it'll hit, right? So this will be content categories as well as security categories, right? Um, and of course, we're going to be providing you the, the date and time that they were accessing this information as well. Um, this security, or sorry, this activity search has a very strong um, filtering and, and, and search capabilities as well too. Um, if you go in here, you can search by multiple identities. For example, if you want to, if you want to search Billy and a uh, a network as well too, that's possible. Um, you can throw in a domain here to see if Billy has actually, um, you know, visited a particular domain, etc. Um, that's the search. Um, the filtering is very strong. If you want to filter by blocked. Um, by block destinations as well as your roaming computers, for example, you can see that it's it's um, these pillboxes up here allow you to you know add in and remove um, um, add and remove filtering choices um, as you please here. So we're taking a look at all roaming computer all all blocked re requests from roaming computers, right? So you can see who's accessing those exact which roaming computers are accessing those block sites and why they're being blocked. Um, the next report that I'd like to show, let me bring up our navigation bar again, is the activity volume. Now, um, this activity volume uh, report um, is great to show um, you know, a, a high-level overview of all of the security categories that are, are being triggered on your, your network. And you, know, you can filter this by you know, the last 24 hours, um, yesterday, the last seven days, or even throw in your own custom date range here. Um, you can filter by date, but you can also filter by identity. Right now, this is covering your entire network, so we're taking a look in the last 24 hours, how many um, malware um, domains were being blocked, how many um, you know, phishing um, domains were being, uh, were being blocked, and how many were actually also being allowed, right? Um, and this is a, this is a great to see, and you know I, I kind of hinted at a use case for um, uh, for crypto mining earlier, right? So you, let's say you don't have crypto mining um, enabled in your policy right now, but you're actually seeing a high uh, uptick in it um, in the uh, the allowed category, right? We want to we want to actually go uh, and 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 visit and see what kind of activity is uh, is associated with crypto mining, right? Uh, this report allows you to pivot, and actually all of our reports pivot into each other, right? So um, this is going to pivot in back into the activity search, and I'll do that for you right now. You click on that uh, little magnifying button. You can see that it filters for um, you know, allowed requests with the um, security category crypto mining, and it shows why it was being allowed and what categories it falls under, right? So that's, that's really helpful um, for you to kind of you know, uh, 
to help inform your um, your policy making uh, process, right? So that's activity volume. The last one I wanted to cover um, was app discovery. This was just um, uh, this was uh, newly introduced, um, and it is probably going to be taking over for our cloud services report up here. Um, this will help us basically um, apply a risk score and um, identify which users um, are accessing what apps uh, on your network, right? We're taking a look at this, we're taking a look at apps, you know, installed on um, personal, uh, personal cell phones, uh, installed on sanctioned and, or sorry, uh, supervised and unsupervised devices, et cetera. Any, uh, because this is the, NS based, we're taking a look at what um, cloud apps are being accessed on your network, regardless of device, right? Um, if you're taking a look at the report right now, we're, t we're, we're flagging particular categories that might be uh, risky, right? Depending on your risk tolerance. Um, and anonymizers is a, uh, a, a, a popular category and one that if you take a look into the details here, you can see all of the, um, uh, apps that are categorized as an anonymizer. And if you already have a, you know, a corporate VPN in place and your users, you know, aren't allowed to, um, your, your users aren't allowed to use separate VPNs when they're on, on the network, you can, you can see, you know, which users, if you go into, let's say, for example, you want to go into Express VPN, you can actually go into the identities and see which users are accessing that app. And, you know, maybe, you know, open a conversation with them to kind of tell them um, what your, um, you know, you know, what your cloud usage and compliance is on, on, on the corporate network is. All right. So this report is a lot about, um, uh, not only about blocking apps, but it's also about um, user education, right? Um, letting, informing users about corporate policy and what is defined as, you know, um, as sanctioned and unsanctioned. Um, let me go back to the actual dashboard here. Um, we can take a look at particular um, flagged apps as well too. You can see that you know cloud storage app like this mega app has a very high um, high risk rating, right? We can take a look at that by clicking in and seeing what those actual factors are, right? Um, usage risk, you know, like the volume of of these D DNS requests. How you know how the more often a, a an app is used, the higher the risk usually. Um, we score business risk as well too, and uh, taking um, taking feeds from Talos Intelligence web reputation, for example, or you know the financial risks, etc. Um, you can also you know block this app uh, via your policy as well. Um, we covered that earlier in the control applications uh, while we're stepping through the the policy creation, but you can do it within this app as well. Okay, so those are reports there. Um, one thing I want to note uh, with reports here is that you can actually um, schedule these reports to be sent to you, right? So let's see a list of reports that uh, you can schedule. Um, for example, we, if you don't want to log in every single day um, into the umbrella dashboard, but you want to be, you know, aware of what's going on with your network. Um, you can have a, a security overview sent to, you know, sent to you, your IT team, or for example, even um, your, your your CEO if you, they need like an, a, you know, executive summary of what's going on with the network for that week, for that day, for example. Um, um, and so these are the the example reports, or sorry, these are example uh, reports of uh, of what you can actually schedule and. Taking a look at one right now, we can go into the activity volume, the one, one of the reports that I highlighted earlier, and see exactly what gets sent. Let's see. <clears throat> not sure why that's not coming up, but let me just go back and try the security overview. Okay, great. So this is a security overview. If you want to send this to your, or your, um, your uh, your CEO as, as a, like a high level weekly update, for example, right? Um, we can schedule that up here to the top, right? Um, and you can, you know, apply filters to this. So um, if you wanted to, for example, um, send this on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, or even a monthly basis, you can, you can select that here. And you, you can even choose, you know, if you want to CC this uh, to your IT team, um, 
you know, uh, or, or to a specific mailing list, for example, you can do that here. I'm not going to actually save this, but um, all of our reports, uh, so these options, these are the, the reports that you can actually schedule and have sent to, um, to you on, um, depending on your needs right here. The last thing I wanted to cover is this admin section here um, and, and the accounts that you can have um, set up um, to access the dashboard. Um, right now, um, listed, we have only a full admin and read only, but if you go ahead and click the invite button here, you can take a look at the, se uh, the separate roles here. Um, we have um, options for full admin. Um, if you have any junior admins that you don't want, you know, making any changes, for example, you can give them read-only access to the dashboard. Um, if you have, for example, like the marketing team um, and they want to take a look at, uh, you know, uh, destinations for um, social media, um, uh, destinations for so social media sites, for example, um, you can ap apply a reporting only um, uh, user role to them and they will only be available to access your reports and they wouldn't see necessarily the deployments and policies and other stuff, right? And that's about it. So if you, uh, I'm going to hand this over to, um, I think we're going to go into Q&A right now, right? Sounds good. Uh, Sean, did we have any questions coming in? A few. Tim, could you kind of touch on um, why you would need Umbrella if, you had, say, a Firepower or a Meraki device or any Cisco or any other real Cisco firewall. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I think with with uh, Umbrella and Firepower, these are very like separate solutions, but they're very complementary, right? Um, Cisco takes a or Umbrella takes a very layered approach to security. Um, so, in the you know the firewall example here, um, the uh, where where Umbrella excels is we 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 operate at the DNS layer, right? So before a connection is even made, um, uh, there there's going to be a DNS request, right? So if that DNS request is going to a known malicious domain, we're going to stop that connection before it's even made, right? So this comes into play if your device is already infected and with a you know for, like a botnet or a command and control, and it's you know reaching out to um, a uh, a domain. Um, that's malicious. Um, we're gonna we're gonna cut it off before it even hits your firewall. So um, this is this is this is good because if it, if if that wasn't in place, you know, you're if, if if it does eventually get past your firewall, you know, a um, you know a malicious agent might you know know that it's already installed and it's calling back already, so they can you know stage an attack on your firewall and bring it down, for example. So yeah, um, they're they're complementary to each other, I think. Sean, you might be on mute again. Were there any other questions coming in? I know I just posted for people to go ahead and answer, submit them now. Oh, yep, I, I, I totally was on mute. Sorry about that. Um, Tim, could could you also kind of touch on um, deployment scenarios for the roaming client if they don't have, say, any connect and just the ease of, of, of pushing that out? Yeah, sure. Um, if you, yeah. It, Go back into. I'm going to show this on the actual dashboard. If you go into our uh, our roaming uh, computers section here, and take a look at the the roaming client list, we offer you know Windows clients, Mac clients, um, as standalone clients that you can install to your um, individual devices here. Um, the actual process. Um, I don't actually have. I'm a, I'm in a demo environment, but the actual process is very easy. Um, there's a step-by-step -step wizard that takes you through the installation, and, and and you can have it set up within within minutes on an individual device. Um, if you're you're pushing out the Windows client, we have um, mass deployment methods that you can do via GPO. Um, you can do the Mac clients using um, you know uh, uh, Apple Remote. De is it Apple Remote Desktop? Yeah. Uh, sorry, ARD. Um, so there, there's there's deployment options for that, and we can we also have um, special parameters that you can put in to to customize in the, in the installation as well too. So for example, if you wanted to hide the um, the the actual application from your systems tray, or if you wanted to uh, remove or hide it from the add and remove section of um, of Windows, um, those are, are possibilities or options that you can apply to the deployment as well. 
Awesome. Thanks, Tim. There actually is one more question surrounding some integrations, but I just wanted to add, if you don't mind, on the roaming um, module or the roaming client um, rollouts. Cisco actually did it internally in about an hour, and we have over a hundred and over a hundred thousand employees and contractors. So that kind of tells you just how easy it is to push out um, mass deployment-wise, and how and how quickly you can get get protected. Um, the other question was, was surrounding integrations with with something like um, Cisco's AMP or other Cisco products. Ah, yes, yes. So. Um, this is another example of how um, Cisco is taking a layered approach to security, right? Um, whereas AMP uh, will protect the endpoint, and they're more about file inspection and um, and um, the, yeah, they're more about file inspection and using that to you know protect your 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 endpoints. Um, Umbrella is is going to be protecting your access to the internet, right? So we're your first hop into the internet. So they work very well together. And actually, um, Cisco just released a, um, a new tool, a, a common dashboard that uses AP, APIs on both Umbrella and AMP to bring those tools together on a single dashboard. That's really cool. So if you guys have a chance, please um, you know, take a look at the Cisco threat response that we, uh, we just um, unveiled. It's, uh, it does some pretty cool stuff for, for our incidents response teams um, that are, you know, that are constantly looking at threats and analyzing threats. Um, we're pulling in a lot of, um, we're pulling in a lot of, uh, of other uh, Cisco portfolio into um, CTR right now. Um, right now we have Umbrella, obviously, AMP for endpoints and Threat Grid, but we're also pulling in, you know, um, email security, et cetera. So um, a lot of cool stuff happening in that area right now. Uh, you, you finished that question perfectly because someone just uh, put a um, question into the chat that I was answering, but I'll let you answer it uh, with audio. Um, is there an agent required locally on clients um, for the AnyKind client? Essentially, I, I think they're asking, they have, they have third parties that are VPNing in um, to their ASA, and they want to know if they could also push the module out to those third parties if they're connecting to their, um, to their VPN infrastructure. Yeah, so... Um, uh, are, are, it was the question regarding pushing the client out via the ASA. Right. So, so if so, if they have, um, say, a, a third-party client connecting into their um, VPN, like if they give a third-party VPN access, are they able to then uh, also give the roaming module? Yeah. Yeah. So you can you can put um, if you if you take a look at the the the, the roaming module here, it's just a matter of actually. Um, of having that mo a module, downloading that module profile from your dashboard, and um, and having th that uh, the ASA, you know, um, install the module when they they access it via the, their VPN, so via the AnyConnect VPN. I hope that uh, I hope that if you if you have any color commentary for that, Sean. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that no, no, that pretty much answered. Yeah, and the other cool thing too is um, if you did push it out to them, obviously you don't want to do content on on someone else's machine. That's well, you you could if you wanted to, right? But um, but you could give it a separate policy, so you could do per policy, um, and you could even tag them. So if you know you have a bunch of contract third, third party contractors, add them to a specific group with those roaming clients, and then you could just give them just a security only policy, maybe not lock um, log everything. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's like okay, so Orla. Um, you don't want to install the agent. So in that case, um, you would have to rely on, once the VPN in, you would be able to still um, give them umbrella protection um, while, while they're VPN in. And then once they disconnect, they would just use whatever they already have on, on, on their laptop. Does that answer the question? Okay, excellent. Um, let me see. And Tim, back to the iOS, um, there's currently no Android client, correct? Yes, um, this is actually um, feature requested very often. And um, I think it's, it's top of mind um, for our product and engineering team. Um, there is no specific date on that, but yeah, we, we do get that asked a lot. So. Um, Keep it. Keep your eyes out. Is all I can say. I guess. Uh, 
that looks like that's it for questions. Okay, we can uh, send it back to Kelly then. Excellent, and that's perfect timing. Um, I just want to thank uh, Uten for presenting today. Thank our audience for joining us. Lots of great questions, lots of good, good dialogue, and thank you, Sean, for jumping in to help us answer those questions. Um, you will be getting a, a follow-up communication, an email that will have the recording link, so do look for that uh, probably early next week, I'm guessing Monday, maybe today, but as soon as the recording is available. And also, if you could just take a moment, give us your feedback on the survey today. It is very important to us. We do look at every survey, uh, not only your feedback on today's uh, uh, session, but your feedback on future topics, which you're interested, what's top of mind, we want to know. And with that, I want to wish everyone a happy Friday and a great rest of the weekend. Bye, all. Thanks, everyone.